Today in the United States, it seems like almost any opinion, belief, or cause that supports one thing is automatically reinterpreted as condemning something else. For instance, Black Lives Matter has been interpreted as being anti-cop. Feminism since the 1970s has been labeled anti-male, among a number of other nasty names. How are these responses any different than, say, going to a breast cancer awareness march, only to have this happen? We're here to make sure that breast cancer survivors aren't alone in their journey and that everyone around here is here to support them. You know, colon cancer kills too. Or talking about your favorite ice cream flavor? I just love chocolate ice cream. Oh, vanilla's not good enough for you. Or your pets? My dog is my best friend. So you must want all cats dead. Just because you might support or favor one thing doesn't mean that you're against something else. This is the backdrop for what I want to say in response to an email that I received by a former student a few weeks ago. She wrote that relatives of hers were challenging her sexuality by stating that the Bible says that God made marriage between one man and one woman. And so she was seeking my professional response to that argument. Now, I'll be honest with you. My initial response was, where in the Bible does it even say that? So after an extensive search, thank you, Google, the only scripture that comes to close to that language is in Mark 10 with a parallel in Matthew 19. You can see that verses 6 to 9 seem to provide some credence to what her family was saying. It reads, But at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. But this brings me back to my earlier remarks. Just because Jesus is making a statement about how God brings a man and woman together does not mean that he doesn't do the same for two males or two females. Or let me put it another way. In the 1994 film, Forrest Gump, Tom Hanks' character says that he and Jenny go together like peas and carrots. For Gump, peas and carrots are the perfect combination. So would that mean that any other combination of veggies is wrong? As a kid, I loved peas, but not so much carrots. Are there more nutrients that I can acquire by having both veggies on my plate? Sure, but that does not mean it's bad to simply want more peas and avoid carrots, even though God provided us with both wonderful veggie options. My point is, men and women on many accounts do go together in ways that are very special. And I'm not talking just sexually. And Christ is certainly pointing out how important it is that men and women recognize this blessed fruit of heterosexual marriages. Or should I say veggies? But let's be clear. Recognizing the blessedness of heterosexual marriage is not the same as condemning homosexual marriage. Elsewhere in the Bible, Jesus favors the imagery of bread. He multiplies it in all four Gospels, he consecrates it in three of the Last Supper accounts, and in John even refers to himself as the bread of life. Bread is a universally available and pleasing meal to all cultures throughout the world, and it's fitting that Christ used such a familiar item to teach. But does his favoritism towards bread reject other meals, such as buffalo wild wings? And would him not talking about buffalo wild wings be considered a condemnation of that fine restaurant chain? Now, as we pull back from verses 6 through 9, you'll see that the literary context of Jesus' words deal with the topic of divorce. In brief, Mark 10 and the Matthew parallel are historically about Jesus telling heterosexuals to respect their marital vows and not to divorce. At that time, men were divorcing their wives for frivolous reasons, leaving their women and children abandoned with no one to tend to them. This passage is about heterosexual Jews following through on their Mosaic law. There is nothing anti or pro-gay marriage in this passage. It's simply not the topic. In a patriarchal society that emphasized fertility more than anything, the topic of marriage equality wouldn't have been a topic of discussion for anyone, including Jesus. In preparing this episode, I couldn't help but think of the 2014-2015 Roman Catholic Synod of Bishops on the Family. As a member of the LGBTQ community, I was hopeful by the topics being discussed and that possibly by the end of this conference that maybe the Roman Catholic Church would either affirm marriage equality or at the very least update its catechism language involving my community. I still don't like my marriage being referred to as intrinsically evil. But if you're not familiar with the outcome, the only real change that came about was an update on annulments surrounding divorce. In short, Catholic heterosexual couples now don't need to go through as much red tape in order to get married a second time as they did prior to this synod. So in other words, the Catholic Church just made it easier to divorce and remarry. 
Now, now, how is that not the very violation of the dignity of marriage that Jesus was talking about in Mark and Matthew? I mean, here we are, gays are just trying to get marriages recognized by their church. Yet the synod just made it easier for heterosexuals to start thinking about, well, their second one. 